this video is a brief overview of um, different approaches to HR within organisations or in terms of academic theories and looking at a couple of different delivery models but in particular looking at Ulrich's three-legged stool. I am expecting you to read the additional information that I've uploaded for you and read your textbooks and probably carry out some additional research as well. But as ever, any queries, come back and talk to me. So, as I said, what we're going to look at first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of background looking at the development of HR so we can understand how we've got to where we are now looking at the difference between hard and soft HR, looking at different models of HRM and then um, going into more detail with Ulrich's three-legged stool. So, um, this really goes right back to the Industrial Revolution um, and we're looking at at that point there was just a focus on welfare looking at the fact that in factories employees were being exploited they were working 16 hours a day if not more women children everybody was working in factories and they're uh, working in living conditions were pretty awful so um at that point we had um people emerging or companies emerging that were looking more into um, preventing or stopping the exploitation of workers, improving their working conditions, improving their living conditions. Um, a local example of that would be um, New Lanark and what Robert Owen did in New Lanark. Um, and is followed through by other companies such as Boots, Cadbury's, Round Trees, um, Lever Brothers who all set up communities looking to improve their working conditions, living conditions of their employees. But there was also a belief that by doing this, by taking care of their employees, they were fitter, healthier, happier, they'd work harder and they'd be more productive. But it was concerned with the welfare of the employees. Um, and at that point, we saw the emergence of welfare workers starting to be employed. Primarily, they were concerned with the welfare of women and children, but it did develop from that. And some of the welfare policies that we still see in place today um, stem from the measures taken by these people at that time. So moving on from there, we moved into kind of administrative um, activities, so looking at recruitment of employees, training of employees, managing payroll, but it definitely was uh, an, admit, an administrative function and it was primarily looking at um, personnel officers started to be appointed. Um, that ties in at the same time with um, the work of Taylor, looking at how you can improve efficiency within the workplace, how organisations are maybe structured and um, how work is organised as well. Moving on from there, after the Second World War, um, there was an increase in um, trade union activity basically. Much more communications, much more um, negotiations, dispute, trying to resolve conflict. At this point as well, we saw the rise of um, HR becoming, or sort of at that, at that point it would still be personnel officers, but personnel becoming much more um, professional. We started to see um, university courses being set up, offering degrees in industrial relations and our personnel um, employees started to become more um, experts and moving on from there there was an increase in the amount of legislation emerging so again there would be a requirement for the personnel practitioners to have that legal expertise to be able to draw on that. Um, you then moved on to thinking about 
probably the emergence of HR, you're starting to see a focus on recognising that personnel or how we manage employees isn't just purely administrative. It's also looking to see how how we manage the employees and how that can add to helping the, the company develop, helping the company to achieve its objectives. Um, so it becomes more strategic, it becomes moves from personnel, which is traditionally seen as being administrative, a support function to being a partner with the rest of the company where everybody's working together. And moving on from that, um, bringing it up to the current day, you're moving on to the business partner where HR is seen or hopes to be seen as a partner for the organisation working alongside the other departments within the organisation working with the company to help the company achieve its organisational goals and under that business partner role there would be an expectation from the company as well that the HR practitioner will understand what's happening in the business, will understand how what they do contributes so they should have a good understanding of what's happening in the business and they should be able to take that forward um, and obviously we'll look at that more when we come to look at Ulrich's three-legged stool because the business partner um, element is part of that model. So moving sideways slightly, we're looking at um, how HR is perceived or, or how they're actually applying the HR practices within the, within the organisation. And there are various models that you can look at and um, all I'm planning to do here is to give you a basic understanding that when you start to look at the models such as a Michigan model and looking at other models, you'll be able to put them into context in terms of is their approach of how HR is being delivered, is that a hard approach or is it a soft approach? So for those of you that are familiar with McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y, that's quite a good way of thinking about hard and soft HR. But McGregor believed that um, managers, when they're managing their employees, are taking two different approaches. They can either think that workers are lazy um, they need to be tightly regulated, they need to be tightly controlled, otherwise they won't do their work and they're going to be motivated by money. So offer them incentives, give them um, rewards for working hard, they will work harder because they know they're going to get something at the end of it. So it's a bit like the carrot and the stick. If you use a carrot, it'll make them work harder, but if they don't work hard, then there will be repercussions, there will be sticks applied as well. So. Theory X is your hard HRM. It's looking at controlling the employees quite tightly. Um, the employees are, are just doing what they're told, basically. From the company's point of view, there's going to be a very, very strong focus on profit, on making money. They're going to see the employees as a cost. And obviously, that is a cost that's got to be minimised. So they're looking for... The, the cost of the employees are what, that they're worried about. Are, you know, are they spending too much money on the employees? Are the employees giving value for money? Are they returning um, the money that's been invested in them? Is that coming back to the company? Um, so that's our hard HRM. It's very much focused on um, how much something's costing. So there's a definite cost focus with hard HRM. Soft HRM is taking more of the Theory Y approach to McGregor. So it's McGregor's Theory Y looks at if we trust our employees, if we give them autonomy, if we let them have control over how they do the work themselves, if we have lots of policies and procedures within the organisation that support that, then we're going to get better performance out of our employees. We're going to have employees that are going to be motivated. They're going to show commitment to the organisation. They'll go that, that step further. They'll show what we call discretionary um, effort or discretionary behaviour. So soft HRM is the idea of having 
HR practices in place that are going to improve performance, give us high performance working perhaps. So you're looking at controlling how the employees do their work, how we get the most out of them by motivating them, by encouraging them, by having employee engagement type approaches. So training and development, lots of opportunities, recognition, giving them autonomy, giving them control over perhaps deciding how they're going to do their work. And by doing that, you're going to get better performance out of the employees. As I say, these are totally different approaches and generally the theory suggests that because they're at opposite ends of a spectrum, they're unlikely to be working together. Um, but I think there is some literature out there which suggests that sometimes that can happen, that there could be elements of both. And that's one of the things you'll find, or perhaps you've already found from your studies, that you will have the theory that says this is what, what should happen, this is how it should be done, but then you're going into the workplace and thinking, well, bits of that work, but not all of it. So you've got to decide what works, what doesn't work, why is that not working? And when I'm asking you to critically evaluate something, that's what I'm looking for you to do. I'm looking for you to say, right, this is what the theory says, but what does that actually look like in my organisation? Are there bits where it's working? Does it work entirely? Does it not work at all? And here's why. So I'm looking for the justification to explain why it's not working or why it does work. So that's what I'm looking for you to do when you're critically analysing or critically reviewing anything. Um, a few of the questions that I've set you in the study guide will ask you to do that. So looking at this is a theory, how does that relate in your own, in your own organisations? <clears throat> so now in terms of the actual models of the HR function, the one thing I want you to be really, really careful about um, at the moment, we're talking about models of HR. So we're talking about how HR is structured, how HR is actually delivered within the organisation. Next week's class is going to look at HR strategies. So you need to be clear about what's a model of HR and what's a strategy so that you don't get the two of them mixed up. So what we're looking at today are models of HR. Most of these I'm just going to talk through in terms of having the slide in front of us at the moment. So you can have centralised HR, exactly as the name suggests. Everything's done from head office or one central base. So all HR, everything's all held, held centrally. Or you can have a decentralised function where perhaps a good example might be councils. You have a head office. Maybe it's sort of corporate HR where they will still do some strategy and they'll maintain and make sure that things are done consistently across the whole organisation. But they may devolve HR down to the individual departments. So the education department may have an HR team. The social services, social work department might have their own dedicated team as well. So that would be decentralised where the devolving power to um, different areas within the organisation. Ulrich's three-legged stool, I'm going to come back and talk about that. Um, but you will be able to recognise, I hope, elements of that perhaps from your own organisation. Um, outsourcing happens quite a bit, doesn't it? So you might have payroll outsourced. Outsourcing happens across the organisations as well. You might outsource your cleaning support. You might outsource other elements of your organisation as well. But you can outsource training. You can outsource perhaps even part of your employee record keeping and things like that as well. But outsourcing is where the company decides that they want to keep focus on the key elements of what they do and other aspects that they perhaps can, it can be done more efficiently by another organisation, um, you would outsource that. So outsourcing is rather than doing everything in house, you're outsourcing it so that it's going to be more cost effective for the organisation. One element of 
models of HR that tend to get overlooked is the, the role of the line manager or the importance of the line manager. So you're devolving so much so that HR is not dealing directly with the employees. You're not doing a lot of the HR functions yourself. You're, you're expecting and you're asking the line managers to do that. So your line managers are quite heavily involved in personnel management activities as well. So there's a model of the HR function where it's not going to work without the role, without the line manager being involved as well. And that's really what we're talking about there. When you're looking at the, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're looking at the line manager side of things, you're thinking about the effectiveness of that, why it's a good idea. <clears throat> It's good because they are working closely with the employees and know the employees. But you also need to think about what are the criticisms? What, where does the resistance come from? So we know managers don't like doing this or are not comfortable doing this. So why is that? And how would you get around that? How would you get the line manager more involved? How would you get them to see the value of them having that um, HR remit as part of their job as well? So as I said, want to spend more time looking at the looks three-legged stool rather than anything else. Um, so we have a nice little diagram here. I thought rather than just having words, it would be nice to have a picture of a stool. So Ulrich has over time created or developed different theories. Um, and this is what it's culminated in. So there are other versions which have different elements, maybe have four or five different elements in the model, but this is the one that is most popular at the moment. So we have shared services and Ulrich's idea is that ideally a company will have all three of these elements um, in place within the organisation at the one time. So I'm just going to talk through what for Ulrich's point of view, what these different elements should look like and what they should be doing. So shared services would be the administrative functions of HR. So we see that a lot with um, companies or HR departments setting up effectively a call centre where you're phoning in and you're looking for advice or perhaps now it's also something that could be available electronically but shared services are the administrative functions of the HR department. Your strategic business partner as the name suggests is going to be a business partner for the organisation but they should be operating at a strategic level. They should be working with the organisation or the department. Depends on the size of the organisation um, within the college we have business partners who are associated with um, specific departments. So our department, has, we have our own um, HR business partner and they should be working with, as I say, the business or the department. They should be working with them to establish what are their strategy, what are their objectives, what are they trying to do. So they know that inside out, they understand the company's objectives, they understand the the department's short-term goals, what it is doing to try and help the organisation achieve its goals. And then they should be looking to say, right, okay, if that's what you want to achieve, how, as an HR person, how as an HR professional, practitioner, how do I make sure that we're developing the, the strategies within HR that are going to help you achieve that, that are going to help you deliver what it is you need to do so whatever the HR business partner does should be tailored to the business needs and the business objectives so the business partner should not be working in isolation they should not be working with with an HR and sitting in an ivory tower which I know is an accusation that's leveled against HR regularly a business partner should be out there working with the business, but they should be working at the strategic level. They should not be working at the operational level. That's where either your shared services should be working or perhaps that's where the line manager should be operating as well. So a strategic business partner, generally speaking, should be a generalist because you should not have a, a business partner for recruitment a business partner for employee relations your strategic business partner should be doing 
all of those aspects. So there's one point of contact for the organisation or for the department. They know that that's their business partner and they'll be there to help them with whatever. Where the technical expertise comes from is the centres of excellence. So what the company should have is also have a centres of ex a centre of excellence where there are experts that the business partner can go back to. So they will know how to deal with things and how to support the comp the, the organisation or the department on a day to day basis, helping it to achieve its objective. But if they need technical expertise in employment law or in job evaluations or whatever it is, they can go to the centres of excellence and they'll get that specialist expert advice. So the three-legged stool ideally should have all these three different elements supporting each other and working together. The reality is for some organisations, they're just not big enough to support something like this. Um, some companies might have one or two elements. Some companies might just have business partners. The shared services could be not just HR. The shared services could be a shared service centre that's providing support to lots of different parts within the organisation or sometimes linked a little bit to outsourcing. Shared services could be the pooling of resources across a, a couple of different organisations. So I've seen it with councils where um, councils collaborate and they set up a shared service centre um, prior to the merger of the police services and the fire services. I believe that they maybe work the same way in some elements as well. So shared services could be internal, could be outsourced, um, but there are lots of different ways in terms of how this is actually rolled out and how it's delivered within organisations. So don't feel that because your organisation does not 100% match the model, it doesn't mean they're not using it. A lot of companies will cherry pick the, the bits that they like. So one of the questions that I've set for you in, in, your, in the study guide is to look at this model and think about, is this something that's actually rolled out in your organisation and to what extent does it work? If you don't use it at all, is it something that could work? Could it be improved? Could it be enhanced? So I'm looking for you to always be thinking about the realities of what actually happens and models are there. Academics will put them forward in the literature and they get reviewed, they get critiqued and new models are developed based on what's gone before. So don't be frightened to say, well, actually, this is what OIC says. You've got these three elements, but here's what I think it could be developed or it could be improved could add a fourth element, make it a four-legged stool, I don't know. But you've got to think about how things might improve or could be developed. I hope that has proved helpful.